Daniel Gilbert is a Harvard psychologist, and he used to say that just like physicians have the Hippocratic Oath, you know, we vow to do no harm, so psychologists also take an oath. And when they get their PhD, they promise that at some point in their professional lives, they're going to publish an article containing the sentence. And the sentence goes something like this. Okay, the human being is the only animal that. And it's up to them how they want to finish it. Now, he's clearly joking, but there is some truth to this, because over the years, there's been hundreds of versions of this paper, pub I'm sorry, of the sentence published. Most of them debunked later. Right, so at the beginning we had uh, the human being is the only animal that has language skills until chimpanzees started learning sign language. And that was, well, but we're still the only animal that can use tools until they showed that even birds can use tools. So what I'm trying to say is that initially those sentences were debunked by animal studies, but recently this, well, I like to think about it as the battle for mankind's sense of uniqueness. So this battle is recently waged against computers, right? We have, well, we're still the only ones that can play chess or Go, and, well, we know how well that ended, right? So, <laughs> anyway, there are still many areas today that are considered to be outside the reach of computer science, what I call soft concepts in the title of this talk. And I'm going to argue that these territories are the most interesting places for computer science research, okay? That they define a really intriguing set of challenges. And more importantly, they also have lots and lots of applications, because every time you make progress in those areas, it pretty much directly translates to improvements in the way you interact and collaborate with computers. So this tech cloud over here is just some of the concepts that my research has tackled. Okay, so for example, creativity and humor and uh, coherence. And in this talk, I'm going to talk to you about two such projects, okay, that really demonstrate two approaches. Um, I don't know, my favorite tools in the toolbox. And the first one I used to call the axiomatic approach, meaning you take this soft concept like coherence and formalize it mathematically, come up with an objective function. And the other is the data-driven approach, which is more the machine learning flavor, where you use data to guide your search for this objective function. Okay, it's all going to become clear in a couple of slides. So I'll start with the first example, the axiomatic approach. Okay, and this project is called Metro Maps of Information. So here's the idea. Suppose you're trying to understand a really complex news story. Okay, the presidential campaign right now in the US, the Greek debt crisis, something like this. So what do you do? You, know, you probably go to a search engine, right? We love search engine. The thing is, search engines will return 57 million results, but not tell you how they fit together, right? There's no structure, there's no big picture. So the system I proposed was called Metro Maps, where the input is a set of documents, like those 57 million query results, and the output is a map, where a map is a set of lines, and each line is a chronological sequence of articles that follows a coherent narrative thread. Okay, so this line tells you how the Greek bonds are rated. Huh? Huh? Okay. Better? Okay, so this line tells you how the Greek bonds are rated junk. They have to come with those 30 plans to get a bailout. And different lines focus on different aspects. You might have another line about strikes and riots, and another line about Germany. Okay, so you're supposed to look at this map and get both the temporal dynamics and the structure. So, what are the important storylines and how they interact? Okay, motivation clear? Good. So, how do you do this? So it's basically what I said earlier. It's a really hard problem because you don't know what you're looking for. If I show you a good map, then you know it's good, but it's all very intuitive. So, this is where the axiomatic approach comes into play, where you start by asking yourself, so, what properties are you looking for on an intuitive level? So, what makes a good map? For example, I said each line is coherent. But coherence is this soft concept. How do you formalize it mathematically? How do you come up with an objective function, something I can feed to a computer? And once you have one, you know, all interesting objective functions are NP-hard, so there's the problem of optimizing it, of coming up with an approximation algorithm. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the first two stages, okay? Just how to come up with the intuitive properties and how to formalize them. Okay, so just, I won't take you throughout the whole tour, but just think for a second about what, what properties you're looking for. I gave you the first one already, it's coherence, right? Each line follows a coherent narrative thread. But what does that mean? So a while ago, we actually had a paper about this notion of coherence, where the question was, given a chain of articles, how do you measure the coherence of the chain? Okay, and I went around and asked people this question, and they all say the same thing, oh, oh it's really, really easy, just make sure that you have strong transitions. Okay, document one is similar to two, two is similar to three, three is similar to four, and you're good to go. And the entire point of this paper was that strong transitions are not enough. Let me show you why. Okay, so the bars here mean that the word on the left appear in the article above it. So this is an article about the Greek debt crisis. 
Now, suppose you want to build a coherent chain using strong transitions. So you're looking for a second document that's similar. You might come up with this one, what Republicans think about the debt crisis. Now you're looking for a third document, and you're looking for something similar to the second, right? So you might come up with this one, what the Pope thinks about Republicans. And it just goes downhill from there. Okay, so what happens here is that it's kind of a stream of consciousness behavior. You see the staircase effect, where each transition is strong, but because of a completely different reason than the other transition. Okay, so it's incoherent. Let's try again. And this time, keeping in mind that it's not just about local transitions, it's more global. So article about the Greek debt crisis, article about what Republicans think about the debt crisis. But this time you remember where you came from, and you know that Republicans are not the main issue here. So you keep on finding things that are still on topic. Okay, so you see how everything is smoother and nicer, and most importantly, there's a small number of words that seems to capture the entire story. Okay, so we took this intuition and we basically formalized this as a linear programming problem. Okay, so we have an optimization problem here where we try to capture this intuition of the previous slide. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through this. But all I want to tell you is that this uh, is an LP and we have a rounding solution and it does get coherent chains. Okay, so this was coherence. And we actually did the same thing for the other objectives we came up with. So we had uh, coverage, meaning that the map should cover things that are diverse and important to the user. And connectivity, meaning that if two lines are related, the map should reflect this, okay? They should intersect. So we took those three things and we formalized them again. So coherence is an optimization problem, coverage is a module optimization, and connectivity is a small objective that just tries to encourage line intersection. And the most important thing about this slide is that we actually have an algorithm with theoretical guarantees to optimize this objective. So let me show you an example of the output. Okay, we started from something really simplified, so that's the real thing. We have a line about how Greece struggles to say a flow, they need help, is it enough? Another line about strikes, another line about Germany, and a tiny line about the IMF. And at this point, you should be staring at the screen and saying, OK, it's a cute picture, but is it good? Is it useful? So uh, we actually ran a lot of user studies trying to answer exactly this question. I don't have time to go through them, but just let me give you the punchline. And the punchline of all those user studies was that maps are most useful as high-level summaries for stories that don't have a single dominant storyline, like non-linear stories, stories where lots of things is happening, what, what I like to call spaghetti stories. Okay, and for those stories, there was like huge benefits. Okay, so this was maps from, from the news domain. And my goal in the next few slides is to convince you that it's not just about news. Okay, because those axioms, they're really, really easy to translate to other domains. Okay, they just say the same in other domains. So let me tell you briefly about three applications. The first thing we did was trying to see if maps can help a student understand the state of the art of some field, like what's reinforcement learning been up to. So we ran metro maps on ACM papers. And again, we did a whole bunch of studies, and it does help students understand the, the material. Next thing we did was uh, legal documents. Can maps help lawyers argue a case? So we ran it on Supreme Court decisions, and we had reality check with a bunch of lawyers. And last thing, just for the fun of it, I wanted to see if maps can help us understand the structure of complex books by which I mean Lord of the Rings, <laughs> although recently I got a request to do um, a song of uh, Ice and Fire. Uh, so this is the Lord of the Rings map. I don't know how much you remember the story, but you can see the hobbits starting walking around, they meet people, they split after the council, the bad guys are down there, they're going to meet the good guys, so lots and lots of structure emerging. Okay, so this was the Metro Maps project, where the goal was to take a newsreader, a student, a paralegal, anybody that has lots and lots of data on their hands, and used to rely just on search and give them some perspective of their field, okay, so they can see the structure and the connections. And the way to do this was this axiomatic approach of trying to come up with those concepts like coherence, coverage, connectivity, and formalizing them. And like I said, we had a bunch of user studies to validate our method. Okay, breathe in, breathe out. Second approach. So this is the data-driven approach, and the project is called Inside Jokes. Now, a while ago, I ran into Bob Mankoff, who's the cartoon editor of The New Yorker, and he happened to mention that he has a data set of cartoons. And I was immediately intrigued because of exactly what I told you earlier, right? Humor is kind of the epitome of what I'm looking for. Everybody says, that, oh no, it's this mysterious aspect of human intellect. You know how in movies, in science fiction, you have robots and computers that can do anything on Earth. But when it comes to telling a joke or understanding a joke, then it looks like this. So, <laughs> so I was really curious to see what I could do about humor. Now, as I told you earlier, that there's lots of applications because humor is such an important dimension of communication. 
And instead of going through those applications, let me just give you my favorite two examples. Okay, so the first one. April Fool's Day last year, Tesla had a press release how they were going to do a smartwatch. Now, this was clearly a joke, okay? They had sentences like, uh, not only will it show you the time, it will show you the date, like three exclamation marks. But apparently some algo trading companies fell for this. So lots of companies lost lots of money because their algorithms couldn't detect a joke. Um, the other example I like is Facebook. A while back, they wanted to do an automatic satire tag because users kept believing that the Onion articles were real. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there are things to do with that. Okay, so let me tell you about the actual project. How many of you know the New Yorker cartoon contest? Oh, more than I expected. Awesome. So every week they publish a cartoon without a caption, and they invite people to submit their own ideas for the joke. And they receive something like 5,000 uh, submissions, and then there's an intern who reads throughout the whole thing and kind of finds the funniest ones. Now, I used to think this was a dream job until I actually talked to this guy. <laughs> no, he said, you know, after 200, nothing is funny anymore. I want to crawl under my desk and die. <laughs> okay, so I was like, okay, great. So can we help this guy? Or can I build an algorithm that will automatically rank those captions from funny to not funny? And of course, not perfectly, but can I at least save some of his workload? Okay. So it's really the same problem as before. We have this soft concept of funny, and I want to formalize it. But unlike the metronomes, I was just sitting at my desk, and I was stuck. I had no idea where to start from. And then I went reading a whole bunch of books about humor research, and I got even more confused. So I was like, OK, so let's try to use data to actually guide the search. So constructing a data set. We started from those 16 cartoons, and this is actually my, one of my favorite. You see this car salesperson trying to convince this poor couple to get into this part car, part monster creature. No, just take a couple of seconds and think of a caption yourself. It's a fun game. But um, upon seeing this, one of our submissions was, it's a hybrid. <laughs> Which I think it's nice. Another one was, uh, just don't kick the tires. <laughs> Which again, you see this kind of caption. So we basically put this in Mechanical Turk and ask people, so which one is funnier? And we collected judgments. We collected something like 100,000 judgments that boiled down to something like 5,000 pairs on which we had wide agreement, meaning I think five people at least ranked them and at least 80% agreement. And then we took those and we said, okay, let's try to extract features. So like I said, I read books about humor research. I read uh, this article here, somebody who won the contest multiple times shares his recipe for victory. I just tried to find features everywhere I could. You know, the length, the sentiment, the location of the joke, readability, perplexity, part of it, everything. Yeah. And let me just tell you briefly about the two most interesting features there, I think. So first, I just said joke location. You know, it, it's usually considered a good thing to keep the joke to the end, but we don't really know where the joke is. So what we did, we trained the language model. And I said the joke is the part of the sentence with the lowest perplexity. Meaning you train a language model and you start reading the sentence, it gets 25 miles per, and your language model is screaming, like, gallon, gallon, it has to be gallon, maybe a liter. But then you see this rabbit. And this rabbit came out of nowhere, right? You were not expecting it. So this is the lowest perplexity, and this is the funny part. Or the next sentence. And this is our paleo model. Um, anyway, so this was one. The second one, I thought that even people shouldn't be very good at this task without being able to see the cartoon. So we had to take the cartoon into account somehow. So what we did was saying, well, most of those cartoons have a context, like here there is a car, dealership, salesperson, and there is something anomalous, like in this case, animal or legs. So we look at the words of the caption and try to see how it bridges those two things. Right? So for example, it gets 35 miles per goat. So goat is uh, closer to animal and miles is closer to the car salesperson. So we computed the word to back distances. And just to show you another example, uh, so you see this cartoon, the context is there's an office and a secretary, and the anomalous is this stairway to the sky. So if you compute those features, okay, x-axis is the similarity to the context, to office, y-axis is similarity to anomaly. Uh, so can you see here at the bottom right, there is, I'm sorry, he just stepped out of the office, which is a perfectly normal office sentence. Then the other corner you have, yes, you really can buy a stairway to heaven which focuses heavily on the anomaly. And it gets really, really fun when you get close to this line, to the diagonal, where you see the word plays, like, um, our technician is addressing the problem with the cloud. <laughs> I, know, I like that one. OK, so let me just give you the bottom line, what we learned after we use, uh, what was it, random force, a whole bunch of other things. If you want to win this contest, 
First of all, use simple grammar and surprising words. Okay, like it gets 35 miles per goat. Super simple grammar, but you don't see this goat coming. Now, a proper noun is completely and totally kill a joke. Like, oh my God, Florence Ziegfeld has gone to heaven. Okay, how many of you know who Florence Ziegfeld is? I had to look him up, and it's still not funny. <laughs> By the way, there, there's some caveats to this, like jokes about the NSA are more funny, but in general, proper nouns are a bad idea. Uh, not surprisingly, it's a good idea to keep the joke to the end, okay? There's a reason they call it a punchline. And it really pays to bridge this anomalous and uh, normal part of the cartoon. Finally, we actually train the uh, prediction task, so you are given two, two captions, which one is funnier? And we had 64% accuracy. Almost 70 if it's two jokes that kind of hinge on the same idea, like it's a hybrid or this is our latest hybrid. And on one hand, this was really surprising to me because I wasn't, when I started this project, I wasn't sure if we could get any signal, like if we could do any better than random. On the other hand, you can tell me, well, 64% is still not great. But you need to remember that this wasn't the goal, right? The goal was to save the poor intern's sanity. So what we said was, okay, now that we kind of know how to compare uh, two captions, not perfectly, but we do have something interesting, how about we hold a tournament and we pair all captions against each other and it's going to end, uh, result in a ranking. Okay, so we did this. Let me just give you an example. So for the car salesperson uh, cartoon, those are some of the tops. Just listen to that baby purr. And it won't cost you arm and leg. Best not to kick the tires. Just don't ask for leather and you'll save thousands on tires. Okay, let me show you the bottom. The previous owner played frisbee. This is the mortar package. Some stupid pun about GMM. And actually, you know, just look at the very last one. Okay, so we call her a 2015, but technically she's a 14. I, I did not understand this one. And I asked Bob, and he also didn't understand this one. And we emailed the guy who submitted it and didn't reply to us, which was frustrating. So I gave this talk at KDD, and during Q&A, somebody came to the mic and said, I think I get it. I mean, it's 2015 times seven because of dog years. Like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get it now, and I still don't think it's funny, but at least I get it now. It was really driving me nuts. Anyway, so evaluation, so how do you evaluate this? So initially, this intern used to come up with the list of the top 10 funniest things for, for each cartoon. So the idea was, well, if you read the list ranked according to my algorithm, how far the list do you need to go to be reasonably sure you found the funny ones? Okay, just start reading, end up, you know, at 50%, at 20%, what did you find? So on average, we got rid of about half of his workload. Uh, there's a trade-off, right? Because if you're willing to, say, read just the te uh, top 10%, you find almost 40% of the shortlist. Uh, and this is just for exact matches. If you're okay with similar jokes, like, you know, another hybrid joke, then it's way, way better. You don't n really need to read more than the first few hundreds. So, internet is much happier, less suicidal now, I think. Um, okay, conclusions. So the point of this talk was that I think those soft concepts, like what I said about humor, creativity, or coherence, are the most interesting challenges of computer science now. And they have tons of applications, again, for collaboration, for interaction with computers. And I talked about those two approaches, the axiomatic approach, where, like in Metro Maps, where we formalize everything, and the data-driven approach, like the cartoons. And there are plenty of other concepts that uh, me and my group are working on, uh, including insights and trivia and a student that came to me asking about um, mental breakdown in tennis, lots of stuff. So if you have suggestions, uh, I know some concept that you're curious about, I'd love to hear. That's about it. Thanks.